Hello, welcome back to the Art Channel. This week, myself and my colleague Joshua will be looking at an exhibition, Picasso Portraits, at the National Portrait Gallery in London. This is an exhibition which spans Picasso's seven decades of portrait painting and really sees him uh, experimenting and testing the boundaries of what portraiture can be. So this extraordinary painting is called Portrait of Sebastia Jonia y Vidal, who was a Catalonian friend of Picasso in Barcelona. And of course it's so characteristic of Picasso's wonderful blue period between about 1900 and 1904, before he moves to Paris. And we're seeing this gentleman here at the cafe table looking intently at us with his extraordinary head and these large eyes looking rather mordantly at mm. us. And beside him uh, is a prostitute. And it's not quite clear whether there's a kind of suggestion of her or whether she's physically present because there's no kind of physical sort of, sort of, sort of connection or emotional connection mm. between them at all. I think you're right, the way the two sitters are painted, very, very different. He is definitely present, he's engaging with the viewer. The woman beside him is, is a memory, is quite ethereal, is quite caricaturish actually. And to think that she was uh, originally a dog, there was a dog mm. in the painting, x-rays reveal that he overpainted. But I do think it has this real gothic, melancholic feel about it. And it does remind us of Degas and the absent drinker. Picasso said that all good portraits should have a quality of caricature mm. in them. And you can see that in the shape of uh, the male uh, sitter's head, really. The exaggeration, the distortion, that kind of the way in which Picasso is isolated, that very kind of distinctive nature of um, his face and his head. And beside him, of course, is this rather shadowy, mm. emaciated prostitute. Uh, trying to look uh, seductive and jaunty with the flower in her mouth and with the sort of red uh, sort of uh, feathers in her mm. hair. But I am really drawn to this jug on the table with these sort of hard, sort of reflective elements and you can see in the brushwork. And I think it becomes a metaphor really for the brittle um, quality of the woman, her fragility mm. beside. Mm the male sitter, but it also echoes the shape of mm. Sebastian's head. It is, it has these, as you say, these two areas that are really luminous, his head, or a skull, and that jug, and they do echo. It's a very clever composition, you're drawn into this dark corner of a bar, and this is painted in uh, the early 1900s, and it's a, it's a real look into another world. But also there's a great sense of pathos of empathy, of there's a humanity in this portrait. Picasso has seen the kind of sort of gritty character of bohemian life of those struggling on the margins um, in the city and it's a world of excitement but also perhaps of a kind of quiet despair mm. uh, and so it's, it's quite a troubling painting mm. too while nevertheless never leaving that sense of humour behind. Here we're looking at this wonderful cubist portrait of Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, who was a, a friend of Picasso's and a collector, a great supporter uh, of Picasso, and bought many of his early works. This is 1910, so it's three years after Damoiselle d'Avignon, and it's, it's a wonderful portrait. This man emerges from this kind of cubist um, background. Well, the challenge in cubism is whether you can make a conventional portrait can you represent the features of the sitter? And in a sense, it's the most challenging mm. sort of task that Picasso could set himself because cubism is all about fracturing and deconstructing the object, suggesting that the world is very complex visually um, and the information is actually far more kind of nuanced than just the surface and appearance of things. And so he ha here introduces hundreds of little facets that appear to sort of shimmer and reflect the light. You're right, it's, it's this wonderful idea that um, 20th century humans, like all humans, don't see something from a static viewpoint. So the idea of film, photography, mm. the idea of the eye moving around the object, multiple viewpoints, makes a conventional image of your friend pretty challenging. 
And in a way, it's, it's actually quite a conventional portrait, I think. Mm. He does appear here with his, um, his head, his suit, um, the two chains of his watch. You can just see his uh, watch fob there on the front of his body and his hands clasped at the bottom. So you get very close and you have splintered, fractured shapes. You get back and he does emerge from this, um, this kind of ochre, umber background. Cubism, of course, questions all of those traditions in European art history from the Renaissance, really, about picturing and representing um, facts um, as they're seen optically. And Picasso becomes really the philosopher of perception. How do we look at the world? How do we process information? And I always think about how we learn as children how to identify the material world and objects and attach language to it so that we have this sort of, almost like a, a sort of shorthand for mm. communicating with each other. And this is what Picasso is really investigating. And it's so radical, mm. isn't it? It totally changes the nature of art, um, that the artist can move away from this fidelity to, as it were, observation. Yeah, I think we can't overstate the fact that this changed um, perception in painting, in filmmaking, in writing in 20th century art and literature in Europe. It was, it was absolutely radical, the idea that you could deconstruct a human. Mm. There is no edge to this person. Um, the foreground, the background, the human being almost have the same status. And that's, that's very, very challenging. And I think this idea of time is also significant because, it, again, it questions that idea of an object or a person being fixed in time because we're presented with so many different viewpoints of this sitter and we can just about make out features such as the eyes here and the nose and perhaps the chin here. It's suggestion rather than con concrete mm -hmm. fact. It's, it's fantastically rich and suggestive um, and at the same time, fundamentally quite challenging mm. and problematic. Mm. And as you say, radical in that it makes us think that the world is not true in a particular way, mm. that there are multiple viewpoints for 20th century humans. So it, it, um, it was such a huge movement. And where does that leave the artist mm. in terms of being the mediator mm. between, as it were, the object, the person, and, as it were, the receiver or looker? Mm. Well, the job of the artist has completely changed, hasn't it? The job of the artist is no longer to record the world, yeah. but to give you options, um, yeah. different viewpoints, different thoughts, yeah. and that's, that's a whole new way of making a portrait. Here we have an example of one of Picasso's metal sculptures that he makes in the 1950s. It's called Silvette. It's made in 1954, and he was working with a 19-year-old model who he meets in the south of France when he's working on a lot of ceramic production. And what's really exciting about this piece is the way in which it operates in so many different ways, particularly the fact that it's painted on both sides of a flat metal sheet. Absolutely. What's wonderful about it is it's somewhere between a painting and a sculpture. Mm. Patently, it's a three-dimensional piece of work, but it operates in that space between the two. It's, as you say, on a piece of, of sort of bent metal. Actually, he worked these up in cardboard mm. and Silvette's boyfriend mm. uh, cut out the steel templates and then Picasso paints on them. This side is very cubist, it's got that classic look We are looking at the front of her face and the side of her mm. face and this very dramatic ponytail. Unlike lots of Picasso's models, she was a blonde woman, very blonde. And the, it has a, a real drama. For me, it's, um, it's very much about draftsmanship and drawing as well. So I think this is a very successful piece of work. It picks up on that cubist innovation that he achieves with Braque earlier in the 20th century, and it's as if he's returning to those lessons, to those interests, but expressing it in a new media. Mm. And this is so characteristic of Picasso, this sort of restless curiosity about materials, about working in mm. ceramics, working with printmaking, but also with sculpture. And as you have just said, he creates both a painting and a sculpture using this accordion steel mm. um, object that implies this multiple viewing mm. again, almost like uh, cut film mm. jumps mm. from one point of view to another. Um, it's, it's a fascinating thing. 
And it's wonderfully confident. I mean, he paints on the surface this white paint, black paint, but also he leaves the metal to come through. So he uses that, that real truth to materials that he has. And, you know, sculpture is sometimes problematic in that it has to have a very heavy, clumsy plinth. This one stands up. So there's nothing else for your eye except the piece of work itself. Then on the other side, he contrasts that cubist styling of the head seen both in profile and frontally with this very naive, childlike rendition of the face just as a series of marks, almost like, again, one of those uh, cut-out uh, cubist assemblages. Mm, mm. Um, and he repeats, of course, the profile of the, uh, the ponytail, but here he's just in sort of painting wet on wet. Um, to imply the strands of mm. hair. And it is beautiful, as you say, because you're getting, you know, this is the mid-50s, 1954, you're getting all of his experience, all of his confidence, and, and two of his styles on one piece of work. So it's, it's, it's very, very engaging, very, very, seemingly very simple, but I think absolutely beautifully executed. Picasso and the National Portrait Gallery is a, a huge and engaging exhibition. It covers seven decades of this painter's uh, career and there are over 80 portraits here. And I think it's, it's incredible still to see Picasso darting from movement to movement deftly. He can do classical, his beautiful blue period and this brilliant cubism. And later in his career we see him kind of combining and revisiting those. And also I think it's important to think that these are his friends and family and it's, it's very engaging to think that they are central to his way of working. And what this show reinforces is Picasso's underlying humanity, his curiosity, this sort of restless interest in materials, moving from the traditional portraiture to something much more kind of experimental, and also moving from the particular sort of details of a sitter's face and physical features to more universal qualities in terms of mood and feeling. So it's a wonderful and exciting show and a rare opportunity to see so many of his portraits made over the longevity of his career. Thank you for watching the Art Channel. If you've enjoyed this film, please give it a thumbs up. You can also follow us on social media and also subscribe to the channel by pressing the red button on the screen.